Okay, so today um, we will discuss another of our project. This one also happens to uh, deal with social media, I think. Um, but uh, it has a very different kind of application and different, really different, kind of, uh, a different kind of analysis. But um, the idea here is to kind of, uh, kind of see the uh, connection between the kind of technologies that you are learning here and your applications. And again, check out here if there is some piece of things that excites you and you want to work on that, or then you can work with the environment and the state. Okay? This is a project funded by National Institute of Art, by, uh, of National Institute of Health, and you'll see this is a very um, uh, exciting uh, project with uh, exciting application. Today I'll give a brief overview of this project. Uh, for those of us who may be interested in, in working on the project, uh, this is certainly one of the options. So I'll give uh, some sort of depth into what it is we're doing, how we can do that, what we've accomplished so far. And then hopefully at the end, uh, there will be some interest from some of us in joining this project. So the Project Pluto is uh, a project It's a collaborative project between the University Center and the Center for Intervention History and Innovations Research at the School of Medicine. Uh, the acronym Pluto is it stands for Prescription, Drug Abuse, Online Surveillance, and Epidemiology, which is a, a very you know, big, big term. Uh, epidemiology is the study of uh, patterns, trends, uh, cause and effect of uh, health conditions and diseases on the general public. Uh, this project is concerned with prescription drug abuse. We all know that prescription drug abuse is considered a disease, and therefore what we are trying to do is uh, perform some analytics to collect data so that we can develop a better understanding or key knowledge, the attitudes and behaviors of what's really going on in the prescription drug abuse community. Uh, so, just to give some further insight into the motivation of the project, the non-medical use of prescription drugs has recently been characterized as an epidemic by the director of the White House uh, Office of National Drug Control, Drug Control Policy, uh, Gil Kerenkowski, who is uh, very fondly referred to as the drug czar. I find that uh, amusing for the reason. Um, I imagine some of these drugs are resolved in drugs. You know, uh, in any event, on May 24th of 2011, using data from the Center for Disease uh, Control, CDC, uh, Kerlikowski uh, testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee characterizing prescription drug abuse as, as an epidemic. Evidence for this uh, comes from a number of different places. There was one study done by the National Survey of Drug Abuse and Health in which they found that almost 33% of drug addicts who were studied in 2009 uh, claimed that their first interaction with any sort of drug was uh, with prescription drugs. And obviously they later graduated out to open substances and they came out at the point where they're addicts. Um, and so prescription drugs like marijuana, as you would have guessed, are considered to be gateway drugs because they sort of move you into the door a little bit and once you get in, you sort of graduate other uh, things. A second study done at the University of Michigan uh, found that um, prescription drugs are across all drugs that, that are abused uh, actually is the second most abused drugs uh, within the community. Um, and this includes uh, cannabinoids, hallucinogens, uh, opiates, across the whole spectrum of drugs, prescription drugs is is sort of right up there. So it, it's a very serious problem, a growing problem. And <coughs> you see in the media, uh, a number of, of celebrities have actually succumbed as a result of uh, prescription drug use. Uh, again, in, in combination with uh, a cocktail of other drugs, uh, Whitney Houston, uh, Michael Jackson, arguably Amy Winehouse, uh, Keith Ledger, a number of people have succumbed and have gone down the wrong path uh, owing to accidental overdose deaths. <laughs> uh, the show uh, Celebrity We Have uh, through, uh, so it is, uh, for the Insight. The magnitude of the problem. 
there are epidemiolo epidemiological systems and systems uh, to deal with this problem. Uh, many of these <coughs> are local groups, uh, perhaps at universities, uh, government organizations, uh, and even some private institutions have uh, popped up to deal with the issue of prescription drug abuse. Uh, there, is, there are two main issues uh, that make these systems seemingly unable to deal with the, the rapid growth uh, of information spreading in the community. Uh, the first issue has to do with uh, the data collection practices. Uh, what happens typically in uh, drug abuse epidemiology is uh, researchers at the university, for example, or even from private institutions, will meet with, uh, with addicts in one-on-one -on -one interventions groups, counseling groups, or in, in group sessions. And through these personal interactive sessions, they will collect information uh, as audio, of course, and the audio is transcribed into text, and it's sort of there. Uh, well, obviously, there is only so many people that can be interviewed at one time by anyone who's searching. With the, the statistics that we've seen for the drug abuse problem, uh, there is some suspicion that perhaps if we interview 100 people in Ohio, uh, we may not get a good understanding of exactly what the practice is. The data size may not be a representative sample for us to understand exactly what's going on in the community. And so some other systems have actually uh, moved on to use online surveys, uh, or surveys of any, any sort, where they put up a website and you put up a survey, uh, and uh, those who are interested will go to the site and they will the information you collect back, and then you process that information. Uh, there again, you're relying on, on people who are sufficiently interested in finding the questions that are being asked in the surveys uh, appealing enough to respond. Uh, that is sort of a problem in which the, the information is being steered uh, from the back, from the research site, not from the user. Uh, the second limitation, major limitation, comes from after the data itself uh, has been collected from uh, these two various methods. These two methods. Uh, qualitative research, and by qualitative research, I mean uh, research geared at understanding uh, human behavior, uh, understanding that behavior, understanding the reasons for it. Qualitative researchers typically engage in a process we call uh, coding. Uh, all the coding is, is simply looking at some uh, document, some snippet of text, and marking that snippet according to some particular theme. I'll give an example just to flat clarity. Uh, here is a, a snippet of a document that we pulled from online uh, in which uh, an addict had just been released from a rehabilitation facility, uh, and he was describing his state of mind and other things uh, right immediately after his release. Uh, the guy says that I was sent home with uh, 25 <coughs> milligram Suboxone. Uh, Suboxone is a drug that is used for uh, treating withdrawal symptoms. So if you're addicted to Oxycontin, Vicodin, and the like, uh, in an attempt to cease your, your prescription drug abuse, um, you go through rehab and after you get done, or actually while you're there, uh, you're given this drug Suboxone, which is supposed to assist with uh, the shakes and nausea, so he was given five uh, pills of Suboxone. He says that he also got a bunch of uh, phenobarbital. Phenobarbital is another drug. It's used for, uh, it is used for treating uh, withdrawal development. But primarily, it's used to deal with uh, to reduce anxiety and to deal with uh, seizures. So he took all of the 180 milligrams of the phenobarbital and it didn't do anything uh, except it made him a walking gun is. You can naturally appreciate the, the nature of the language that's being used in the community. Uh, he waited for 24 hours after taking the last of these suboxones. So at this point, he's taken all of the phenobarbital, he's taken all of the suboxone. Uh, and because it didn't do anything, we're assuming that's what that would mean, uh, he decided then that uh, he, would, he would inject four milligrams of boot, uh, another important issue. Buprenorphine is the, like Suboxone is one type of buprenorphine. So we have to know this kind of information if we are performing analytics on the text. So he, he decided that he was going to inject four milligrams of buprenorphine. 
And he says, well, it gave me a really bad headache for hours and I almost vomited. You could feel it working overall, but the experience, uh, it wasn't that good. Uh, what's going on here is that we have information that is freely shared, freely given from users in the online community who will give lots of information, right? Uh, online surveys or qualitative, or, or interviews rather, would not be able to capture this kind of information at the extent to which it is voluntary as well. Qualitative coding would simply look at this particular uh, snippet of text, a researcher would, and a researcher may say, well, you know, this text is talking about uh, suboxone injection and the negative experience. Or uh, at the same time, it's talking about using phenobarbital uh, and producing drowsiness or lethargy, something like that. Uh, and so, this sort of captures the second limitation in the quality of the community. Well, you know, if you're reading through text and manually annotating it, there's only so many you can read. Uh, it's expensive. You pay people to do this stuff. So, what we would essentially like to do, and I'll skip the second example, is uh, we would like to address this problem with uh, automated techniques, of course. Just to, to review the issues uh, that are going on in the community that I've alluded to a couple of things. Scalability is the issue, right? You can't do it, you can't do qualitative, uh, you can't do interviews on a large scale. It costs money, it takes time, it takes post uh, There's another issue uh, with coding data. It's the issue of reusability. Um, if I give that same snippet of text from the previous example to a researcher writes stating someone from Ohio State, they will code the same information and consuming, but they will use uh, different words to code, right? And so, while semantically the qualitative codes will be the same, uh, lexical, uh, the codes will look different. And so, unless you have a system that can resolve the differences in the lexical representations of the codes, then you sort of set a step back in terms of collecting huge amounts of data and pulling it all together and analyzing it all together. Right? What would essentially happen is people write statement working on something and they're sort of isolated from the other folks in other places because <coughs> they're all using different standards. What you really need is a unified vocabulary, a standard vocabulary for representing all of the data, for representing all of the codes. The, the other issue is, well, I've already mentioned that there's interoperability and sharing of data. And I've also mentioned this, that the small sample size uh, is not really sufficient to develop a complete picture of all exactly what's going on. So our goal is to facilitate prescription drug abuse and immunology by having automated techniques for extracting information and for, for analyzing that, if, well, first of all, for collecting information, for annotating and extracting information from that data, and then for analyzing the extracted information. So it's a three-step process. Automate the collection, automate the annotation, and then automate the analysis. That way you can glean information from a wide variety of sources, uh, and hopefully if you're lucky like us, you may in fact discover something that you've done before. So, I keep talking ahead. You'd like to automate the data collection. Uh, another task that you would like to be able to accomplish uh, in the process of, of conducting your automated research like this is you'd like to create this domain vocabulary, this standard vocabulary where uh, all mentions of poop, for example, will normalize to uh, Mentions of suboxone, if, it, if they do refer to Ubernoff, then you normalize them in that concept. Uh, whenever you see uh, phrases in the text that mean negative experiences, then you create this standard notion of what a negative experience is, and you map it to negative experiences. And so, obviously, we start getting into the realm of semantics where we're talking about the creation of ontology and the standard of representations and so forth. Okay, so I probably added one extra step in your automated data collection, creating the standard vocabularies and automated extraction, and then the analysis also. We'd like to do that online. So, uh, the overall goal of the project uh, is sort of twofold. Uh, the first phase really involves the extraction of the information collection and the extraction of it. And the second phase involves uh, analyzing the data uh, to observe temporal patterns that sort of give you some insight into what's going on in the community. 
in general, what you'd like to do, though, is use massive amounts of data generated freely from users within the prescription drug abuse community, rich data, from which you can learn uh, information about the spread of, uh, of the epidemic. If you're able to do this, uh, what you can ultimately do is you can design more effective uh, interventionist programs, more effective interventionist mechanisms. You can uh, create better uh, monitoring systems where you, know, you, you, sort of, you sort of see from the data, but like, well, in this particular area, uh, for those of us who watch Breaking Bad, uh, the, the, the blue ice uh, is being disseminated uh, among teenagers, for example. Uh, and we have high attrition rates in high school going on because the blue ice is popular here. Well, perhaps we need to step up security outside of schools or something like that. Um, okay, to give uh, a better sense of exactly uh, where it is we're going with, uh, with this project, uh, let's return to the previous example where I have uh, added some annotations to the text um, in hopes that uh, once the system has matured, you'll be able to identify some, if not all, of this information, perhaps even more. And this gives a sense of how difficult the task really is. Uh, again, it's the same post in the first case. The guy says he was sent home with these five pills. Uh, what you'd like to do from this text, first of all, is you'd like to recognize mentions of, of standard drugs and any slang references to those standard drugs. So at least you can retrieve uh, the posts that, that pertain to any particular drug. Right? Uh, if you're doing interviews and someone mentions, well, you know, I, I used some boom and I injected it and it felt great. Um, there's only so many of these that you can have. If you can identify all mentions of, of concepts in text across your entire data set, then you can write a query that retrieves those documents and well, at least you have the data. Yeah? Uh, if you can't recognize slang terms, for example, boo, uh, which map your boo and Mr. box on something that's all the same, then you may miss a few. In the results section, we'll sort of show how useful this is. Uh, the other thing you'd like to be able to do is uh, recognize uh, sentiment words, words that convey either positive or negative sentiment uh, relative to the, the, the specific drug or any specific drug. In this particular case, uh, the guy says that he gave me a bad headache, uh, and we would need to know that it is actually referring to morphine, uh, which is a challenging problem in itself. Nonetheless, it is significant to, to sort of recognize phrases like bad headache, uh, experience suck, didn't do anything, and so forth, as conveying negative sentiment towards the, the drug being discussed. Uh, other things that might be interesting are also words that convey uh, a relationship between two things. Um, Gave, for example, who gave a bad headache. Gave, in this case, can be normalized to a standard concept, a standard relationship, rather, called uh, causes. So you would need to just look at text, not only identify uh, these relationship uh, conveying terms, but you probably would like to normalize those and map those to some standard terms. Gave, for example, lead to create, make all of those market calls. Uh, and not as important at this point uh, in the project in the sense that we haven't pursued this, I would also need to be able to recognize these temporal indicators as well as measurements of numbers and so on and so forth. So a system that is able to recognize entities must be able to perform some kind of normalization which should recognize slang terms and normalize those to known drugs. Uh, we should be able to identify a relationship conveying terms and not those as well to standard properties. And we should be able to recognize sentiment conveying terms uh, and characterize the sentiment as either positive or negative. Uh, this is very difficult. It's not easy. Uh, we started this and we remained uh, we have reasonable progress at the moment, and I'll discuss again in a bit uh, where we are. However, the ultimate goal of, of an intermediate goal of the 
is to be able to look at this text and extract all the truth. We would like to be able to look at, at this text and have a system that will analyze this segment of text and tell me that this segment of text essentially is conveying the information that suboxone injection causes cephalalgia, if that's the uh, proper term for a headache, obviously not quite a bit of a sign disease either. Right. We would also be, we also ought to be able to look at this segment of text and be able to say automatically that suboxone injection, the amount of the dosage is two milligrams, and so on and so forth across all of the text. In doing so, we ought to be able to create standard concepts for suboxone injection, uh, headache, cephalalgia, um, euphoria, mild euphoria, <laughs> and other others. And so, a starting point of this project naturally is the creation of an ontology to capture the domain semantics in the prescription drug abuse community. And we've done that, and we're continuing to do that. Uh, we have not done the, the full triple extraction as yet, as you can imagine, it's a, it's a process that needs to occur in various steps. Ultimately, though, what we'd like to do is complement that ontology, that additional ontology that we create with information extracted from the text, and then all hell will break loose because we have a number of tools that allow for analyzing structured data and making sense of it. So, the, to give a sense of the overall approach we're taking in the previous uh, phases and components of the project, the initial phase of the project is the data collection phase. We've identified, we've identified three web forums, we've crawled them using uh, custom crawlers that we've built, and for those of us who are now interested in project ideas, uh, these are things for, for us to think about. Uh, we've built custom crawlers that have uh, been updated weekly um, once the data is collected from the, from the websites, we go through a cleaning phase, um, HTML tags, uh, sometimes in text that we've broken, we sanitize them, ensure that end tags are in place for the game tags. Uh, there may be some funny HTML characters that will break your parser, you need to go through a cleaning phase. And then you, we store the data in a uh, data store, in fact, we're mirroring our data both in a database as well as a scene index put data in the index so that we can retrieve it quickly along with the database for storing things like annotation and annotation and things like that. Okay. We have so far created an ontology. Uh, the ontology is created by reusing existing concepts from uh, standard terminology with drug bank, uh, EDP, and so forth, so that we can create a high-level model. For, the for example, uh, we encode information in the ontology like well, um, uh, drugs, uh, they have uh, a name. Um, drugs uh, are used by, by people. General information that sort of capture the high level of what the domain is so that we can later on use that information in our analysis. Like I said, once we've extracted information from the text, we will complement it all together. The other thing that we've added to the ontology is uh, instance level information where for various drugs we create mappings from known slang terms. For example, like I mentioned, uh, the label poop means buprenorphine. Some of these are really interesting. Uh, blue ice, of course, for those of us who are breaking bad, you will know that that's an epithelium. Um, uh, China white, for example, is heroin. Uh, dog food, also, I think, is. Uh, I'm quite amused by some of these when you really eat my food. As well as the text. So, where did you get your information from? Uh, we've used uh, drug uh, slang uh, dictionaries from NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, uh, from NDCP, I can't remember what that one is, from another website called Airwid, and uh, from another source called Drug Slang, drugslang.com. I think they have since so uh, we went through and largely manual. So there has to be some initial manual effort 
uh, to collect some domain information that you ultimately will use later on to collect uh, other information uh, that we sort of in the process of Okay, this module is sort of where we are stuck right now and this is where all the action is. Uh, where we are is we have identified entities from the post using the ontology. Uh, one of my very able colleagues, uh, Lu Chen, has implemented a, an algorithm, an optimization algorithm for automatically recognizing sentiment words and sentiment phrases. And that has been done, we use that result to find some very interesting things. However, what remains are the relationship identification and triple extraction for which I, I may have some ideas on this. Uh, I, I believe we can take a pattern-based approach to identifying initial relationships all the way we'll need to later on and curate those by taking context into account. But we're sort of right here at the moment and uh, we're sort of looking for people who are excited about these kinds of things to, to get on board and see what we can get involved. Uh, once we have extracted all the information from the, from the text, we'll create this big repository uh, where we have, like, like we discussed in one of the previous slides, we have user-generated content on a variety of drugs where the annotations use a standard domain vocabulary and it's being done automatically and it's been updated on a very frequent basis. Having that in place, again, allows us the, the ability to sort of go wild with all of our semantic web tools for analyzing that data. Uh, in the lab, there you've seen Twitteris, uh, there's also another tool called Schooner, another tool called Cutie. Uh, we've developed uh, our video sanitator as well. Uh, these are all tools that will analyze triples in an ontology and be able to make connections uh, Concepts. And I guarantee you, um, if we have that information, when we have that information, we will be able to discover many things. In fact, even at the level where we are at this point, we have found some very interesting things. We recently published a paper in which we made a discovery of sorts on the way that people are, are using uh, paramite, which is a drug for treating diarrhea. I'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay. So, like I mentioned, the, the ontology has been created. It's called the Drug Abuse Ontology for the moment. I think there are at the moment a thousand or something that triples in. Uh, not a lot. Again, it's, the, it's a seed ontology if you like to use that kind of language. Uh, the ontology instances, like I mentioned, they are at the moment known assertions that map slime to drug terms using NIDA and NBCP and Airwind and so forth. What remains is to extract assertions from the text. We have done some initial entity identification, although the subjugation part of this uh, still needs to be done. What we've done with entity identification is we have uh, performed what's called spotting, which is we have used the information in the ontology to parse posts, all of the posts that we get and basically annotate and mark entities in the text that match the ontology, and it's a pure string match at this point, right? And using the pure string match to identify uh, these terms, what it does is it gives us, although we haven't uh, evaluated the precision recall, it gives us a system in which we are able to take in any post and <coughs> tell you as best as we can all of the things that are in it as it pertains to drugs. And believe me, when the uh, qualitative research team look at this stuff, they're like, oh, this is interesting. Uh, here, again, like I mentioned, um, dog food, for example, is heroin. Uh, if you don't have a way of, well, if you don't know that, first of all, uh, you know, you can't find that post, you can't retrieve that post, and you, you rob yourself of the information in that post. Uh, this ambiguation, we are continuing to follow up on this with uh, our collaborator. Um, like I mentioned, like the field peer, Yu uh, Chen has implemented the, the optimization <coughs> for automatically identifying sentiment clues that uses, uh, here is this dictionary or lexicon of sentiment words available from the uh, University of uh, 
it's a sort of, it's a thumbs up. Uh, in any event, uh, it's called the Linguistic Inquiry Work Kiln, uh, and it, it sort of gives a very comprehensive list of the research theory for some time. It's UT Austin. Uh, they've been doing research there for some time uh, on identifying the same kind of phrases. So in that uh, post that we looked at before, where the guy says something that like, didn't do anything, uh, you might be able to, if not find that phrase exactly, find the phrase didn't do uh, as conveying some sort of negative sign. But again, you need to know these things because if you don't, then you're, you might be right. Uh, we have, based on the initial uh, <laughs> analytics for NPLM, sentiment identification. What we've done is we've created this tool of the uh, uh, What this tool does is it allows the qualitative researchers the ability to you know, it. Um, it allows the qualitative researchers to confirm some of these pre-annotation pre-spots that we've done. Uh, an example of what it means. So here's a, a post that we've extracted, and what you see we've been doing is uh, very low doses of buprenorphine to be able to spot that from your body. Uh, oops, for example, that is in fact buprenorphine, and so we'd be able to spot that. So what would happen here is uh, the qualitative scientists would look at these posts, some cross-section of it, and they would mark these. They would say, okay, the mention of oops, the buprenorphine that you have here, that is correct. Uh, the mention of Oops, referring to buprenorphine, that is also good. It will go through this process. And what that will do for us is it will help us to create a, a training set, a gold standard set, uh, in which we have the context, correct? We have the context around which uh, annotations have been made that are correct. And so we can use that context to apply our optimization or our context-based algorithm to the remaining posts to automatically confirm the idea. We, of course, have to evaluate precision recall of that, but uh, this is uh, very common uh, in, in the field of right? So the... Yes. Uh, the word high on the bottom, yeah. I guess you're looking for like a different way of saying it. It's like saying kind of high tolerance. Right. Does that happen often? What we've done is we've just blindly spotted everything and we're relying on the scientists to sort of look at it and say, okay, well, this one's not correct. And we're sort of hoping that uh, having added a number of these posts, uh, a number of, of different uh, drugs or reasons or whatever the difference is, uh, we will be able to develop for that. An idea of the context around the annotations uh, that will help us to disambiguate this ambiguity right? um, If anyone is interested in doing this kind of stuff, then I'd love to talk to you. Uh, the Summarize data. Um, I'd like to see 
over the course of uh, the last five years, for example, by quarter, what are the mentions of, or what, what is the frequency of mentions of the pyramid uh, across some particular site? And I'd like for that to be done automatically uh, at the interface. Um, I'd also like to plot on a graph. Um, show me the comparison between uh, uh, OxyContin, for example, and uh, buprenorphine. So OxyContin is prescribed for, uh, rather, buprenorphine is, is prescribed for dealing with withdrawals. OxyContin is one of the drugs that people um, use. So plot on a graph over some time range uh, what's going on with the number of mentions of that. In addition to that, in addition to that, uh, show me only those posts in which there is negative sentiment towards either drug. Plot that in the graph. Um, and you can sort of imagine that you can, do, uh, you can generate a number of these graphs so that scientists can, can take a look at this and develop uh, a better understanding of what's going on in the text. And this is using merely the uh, entity recognition and the sentiment view recognition. We haven't gone to the level of relationships or extracting our full triples and reasoning on the triples yet. As yet. Uh, just having some insight into what's going on with the data uh, is really useful. I'll sort of get at that. Show you an example. And so we, we really could use some help uh, from students who have uh, an interest in the web design, in client-server interaction, uh, passing data from the front end uh, to a database in the back, uh, querying the database, querying the OCD index, uh, generating these uh, accounts, uh, creating a GNU plot all automatically. Uh, we don't mind it if it takes uh, you know, 20 minutes. Uh, but for those who have an interest in Okay, so having done uh, all of these things and having outlined a very, very complex problem and the promising we can do wonderful things and all that, well, what have we been able to find? Uh, in this kind of research, so this project is an exciting project in the sense that it's a result, result oriented project. Uh, there are other projects in which uh, the goal is to beat an algorithm by 15%, and if you're able to do that, then wonderful things happen. This is one of those projects in which people would like to see results. Well, show me the money. Show me what we're talking about. Show it to you. Okay? Um, the quality of scientists uh, studying prescription drug abuse, they really like to know this. Uh, in, in healthcare as well, this is also a, a big thing where you're studying patient records. Um, you can talk for ages. The doctors will essentially say, okay, well, show me uh, where it is that says that the patients are having a negative reaction to this particular. Okay, so what have we found? What can I show you? We have made a, a discovery of sorts using the entity identification and the relationship identification, uh, having automatically collected, I think, count at this point, it's 970 something thousand web form posts from three different sites. So we have close to a million posts. Uh, Here's what we found uh, when we, we were analyzing the, the drug buprenorphine. In fact, the, the project overall um, it is to study in depth uh, what's going on with buprenorphine, how it is <coughs> reacting and responding to the drug itself uh, that's being used to help you out go through the drug. So, uh, what we did was we annotated the entire process, the entities and sentiments. And uh, we started to, to extract out only posts that contain mentions of buprenorphine, methadone, and a few other drugs I don't remember what that is at this point. It was just a small view. And uh, we gave it to the researchers in the School of Medicine, and they started looking through the posts um, using the software they have called Vivo, which is what they typically use for, for annotations anyway. And so as they were looking through these posts, uh, they sort of started to discover that, uh, well, you know, the posts on buprenorphine, which is the treatment drug, they contain mentions of the paramide uh, quite a lot. But what does the paramide have to do with buprenorphine? Uh, 
Uh, Loperamide is a drug that's used to treat um, diarrhea. Uh, in fact, it's more commonly, it's commonly known as ammonium. Loperamide is actually a version of ammonium. Um, I think you can get ammonium over the counter. The brand of Loperamide, if you look at it, you can't get it. Actually, get a prescription for it. Uh, and so, you know, they came back and they said, well, hey, uh, can you generate this data on Loperamide? Because I want to take a look at it. I'm finding that looking through the data on the morphine, the paramedic is being mentioned very often. I'd like to see what's going on. And so we generated that data set. And we gave it back to them and we went through it. And this is what they found. They found that the paramedic, which is a drug for treating diarrhea, is currently being used to self medicate among prescription drug abusers when they try to quit uh, their prescription drug abuse or more importantly, if their supply of prescription drugs is not currently available. It's an important point. It's an important distinction. It may be the case that you're using stuff and uh, one of your nephews or nieces is going to graduate and you kind of want to sober up a little bit. You're going to be around the family. And so, you know, they ask you to leave a week before, two weeks before or something. So you're down there, you're down in Colorado or something, and you don't have a regular supply. You can't find the guys on the street who sell stuff like Breaking Bad. I'm obviously Breaking Bad. That's good job. <laughs> and you can't quite find the regular supply. Uh, and so, you know, you, you start feeling nauseated, uh, you start feeling dizziness. Uh, you don't feel that well after a couple days. Well, I don't know who discovered this stuff. It would be interesting for us to do a long term review of our data. See when was the first mention of this in the public property. But someone figured out that if you take this drug that treats diarrhea in very large amounts, the term is called megadose, then uh, it actually can help you with your self medication. As interesting as that is, uh, there was some discussion on whether or not, in the process of self medicating and megadosing, you will actually start to feel high start to feel some psychoactive effects. This is interesting stuff. What is known in the community is that the paramedic is a drug that's used to prevent diarrhea, and the prescribed daily dosage is about uh, eight mil uh, 16 milligrams. Uh, if you take much more than that, it is likely to give psychoactive effects. Uh, it may cross the blood brain barrier, but up until now, the evidence for that has not been seen. In fact, there was a study that was conducted, uh, you have a reference, uh, in, in monkeys, I think. Yeah, monkeys, uh, monkeys, mice, and rats, in which the paranoid was shown to actually cause withdrawal in, in these animals. Until now, it was not known that you could use the paranoid for, for self medication, which is actually good, I suppose. Um, but it would be interesting to sort of understand exactly what's going on. In as far as, as these and other practices are concerned. Well, here's the evidence. Like I said, uh, in the community, when you, you, know, you start talking about all this stuff, people want to see, well, where's the evidence of that? Uh, here's uh, a couple of posts uh, in which there are negative, uh, in which can be negative sentiment, although the, the actual sentiment or its negative sentiment in terms of phrasing uh, have not been. <coughs> Verify that I actually have gotten the actual uh, same reports from the, the actual post. I just mind the other few things that just need to sort of make the point. Uh, so, in this first post, the guy says that, uh, well, <coughs> he's taking diarrhea medicine to get high. Uh, so, if it was possible to get high off of the modium, and so this is a immediately trigger. Well, uh, if you don't know that the modium and the paramedic are the same thing, um, you probably miss this because it's impossible. So this is our ontology coming in here uh, to work. If, if uh, it was possible to get high off of modium, it would be illegal, like all of the other good drugs. The guy says, come on guys, just go ahead and buy some real drugs and stop wasting your time and stop the work. Okay? So this is some, some descent towards the notion that perhaps the pair might be used in this way. Someone else replies and says, well, hey, don't be so negative. You know? uh, are you going through withdrawals? Just because it's legal 
does not mean that there's no potential. It certainly does not work to try. The second guy is some sort of an experiment. You know, there might be legal stuff on the market that they try it. They may do things for you. So this guy is a risky perspective. Uh, in the second scenario, uh, someone else says, well, I'm a little bit behind on things. Uh, are there any studies that show that impairment crosses the blood brain barrier? That's the BBB. Again, it would be important to be able to recognize the BBB as blood brain barrier. Because if you would like to look at posts that study impairment with respect to the blood brain barrier and what it is that people know in the community, you'd like to see this. If you don't know this, then Okay. Uh, if so, uh, do you have any links? So this guy is perhaps more of a researcher, a scientist, he'd like to see uh, any links. Uh, he says that this has been going on for a while, but if I remember correctly, no one was successful. But this would be an idea that perhaps at this time, uh, it seems that uh, the use of the paramedic for self-medication is not as pervasive as, as it is now. Because at this point, this guy doesn't seem to have uh, and this is where it starts to get really scary. Uh, another one, another post says that normally around 100 milligrams of the airway would give you a control. So if these were tablets, uh, you typically would get two milligram tablets. Um, the maximum dosage per day is 68 and 60 milligrams. This guy says 100 milligrams would get a control. That's 50. Uh, you're not really supposed to take it. That's, um, that's that's one of the dangerous, right? So, you know, researchers would, would sort of like know this stuff. You start wondering well, what could be some of the side effects of, of taking that many of these pills. Of the of the Someone else says, well, the paramide is in fact enough uh, to give me out of control. It's enough to keep me well without being miserable if I'm negative. So here's someone else saying you now that even after I use the paramedic for a self-medication, it actually works and I feel great. I don't have, I don't feel miserable. But then I have to make it those honest. Someone else says that uh, the paramedic has saved my life during withdrawals and uh, it actually made me more careless with my monthly meds. Is that suggesting that perhaps and so when, you, when the researchers start looking through these posts, right, all sorts of things will be going on in your head. And then you might want to say, well, hey, can you uh, find posts in which the paramide is mentioned uh, together with the memory loss? And you start discovering, you start really gaining insight into what's going on in the community, much more, more so than if you were just doing one more interviews with 40 or you were just doing online services. A wealth of information, and by just looking at a small sample of the information, things really, really get interesting. I think I said this stuff. Uh, here is another post, and this one is particularly interesting as well. It says, uh, this guy said, I just wanted to tell you that the paramedic will, in fact, work. I take 105 milligrams of methadone a day. I'm always cracking up. And, uh, and recently he's been running out. He's been running out earlier due to a new interest in ideas that I use. So he's been taking that out of the net. And he's losing interest in doing that. He says, well, he wants to start. He wants to shoot up, right? Uh, and uh, 200 milligrams of the paramedic will make him almost 100% again. Uh, it would be very interesting really to sort of uh, study the side effects of using such massive amounts of, of these drugs. He goes on to say, however, it, it brings the sickness down uh, to a level of, say, a minor flu, and he's able to return to sleep, and the restlessness goes away. And this is key. He says even a, sometimes a mild opiation effect is, is actually do you ever check like the same person posting multiple times? Uh, we have that data in the, in the database. 
grid. And if we could look at a few more of these, we would see that there's a bunch of different color coding for sentiments that have been annotated and confirmed, and if not confirmed. So, so we could give them uh, that view, although So, good news is that I'm almost finished, so you guys are uh, off the hook. So, project ideas. We should add on here uh, social network analysis, because that is also something that's very important. Okay. Like I mentioned, uh, is to do this, this sorting business. Um, you know, show me, uh, in fact, even without having these annotations done, if you can just type in at the interface and say blood green barrier, after you have selected the pyramid and after you have selected some source, uh, and using the machine index constrained by our, uh, our initial set of posts, um, we would be able to see some things that are very interesting. You can search for a variety of things we'll have to discuss uh, in detail with, uh, with our collaborators exactly what it is they'd like to see. But in fascinating search idea, it would really require uh, a knowledge of uh, JavaScript, uh, the interface that we just saw in the annotator. It uses index.js, uh, which is not very much get familiar with. Uh, knowing some JavaScript, um, knowing some JSON, uh, passing data from the front end, receiving a JSON uh, output from the server, parsing that output, and then just showing, showing it on the interface. We've already done this largely. Uh, we would just be implementing it on it. The second thing is, and I didn't get to sort of stress this because it turns out the tool is not working. Um, one of the things that the tool does is it allows annotations that have not been made in the interface uh, to be done on the fly. So you can highlight method alert, and if this is the, the identifier for method alert, you can click on that, and when you click on it, you can select whether or not it's an entity or something or otherwise, and then you notice that method alert actually becomes, becomes annotated. Uh, there's something very interesting that's going on in step right here, when you see that list of possible matches, right here, um, what's happening is we are pulling the data of matches from the methodology uh, for what the method would be, but at the same time, we are also showing uh, in the ontology the neighborhood among these possible matches. This is more effective if you look at something like oxygen content. Where there are things like OxyContin OC, OxyContin OP, OxyContin, generic OxyContin. There are all these variants of OxyContin. And if someone mentions Oxy in the text, it may not necessarily be a reference to OxyContin. It may be a reference to one of the related concepts. Uh, what, what we'd like to do here is not show this flat view of the ontology. We'd like to show uh, a hierarchy. We'd like to actually show a subset of the ontology. Where you see, you actually see how concepts are connected in the back end, and then the researcher can actually browse to the correct concept to get a better feeling for what it means. Uh, I will show you exactly give you a better view. Uh, and here's that content. Okay. Okay, here's what you see. Right, that means I have to stop <laughs> Okay, but, but here's what's going on. Uh, in this view, what you can see is that uh, OxyContin, a mention of OxyContin may in fact refer to 
any of these five things. Like if, if you see oxy in the text, it actually may mean oxy IR, oxy protein, any one of these. And so what I'm showing at that front end is actually all of these things, but they're just in the flatness. So you sort of have an idea of how they are connected in your algebra. Uh, it would really be nice if we could have someone do that visualization. Uh, it's not difficult, although it's very uh, tempting, but saying stuff like that, because it's hard to tell you. We can tell you that it's not. Um, my estimation is that perhaps it's not. So my battery doesn't die. The other things are uh, context-based entity identification, perhaps maybe a little bit uh, too much at this point. But uh, another interesting thing to do would be to do this pattern-based uh, phrase or triple extraction. Uh, there is uh, some software that we have access to uh, that will allow you to specify an entity, a second entity, and you, you can look for concepts anywhere in between or before or after. Uh, in this way you can specify those in between concepts as sentiment words or as relationship words. This will really allow you to do start to extract those these four triples. Right? Where you can say for oxycontin and for cephalotin, which is heavy, find me um, mentions of all of these particular kinds of, of predicates either in between them, right before or right after, up to some number of words. And we'd like to take a look. Um, and I think that's it. So, thanks a lot. If anyone would like to uh, like to work on the project, um, I'm in free version. We always ask our chef to find me. Knows your animal. All right, so, uh, any questions for broadly speaking? Uh, there the are a couple of things that are doable. Uh, you can think about uh, you know, this one as a um, particular context in which you can apply our jury project idea that I have in mind. Uh, the jury project idea is about the search. And uh, this is um, a way to do the search but uh, apply it to more specific problem that becomes more interesting per se, more demonstrable because. The toys, uh, search engine, or jury equipment, and we uh, have really hard to demonstrate that you can work because you have all these big search engines like Google and Google and Google. But anyway, so something to think about. Right? Uh, some of the things that we talked about here are even more advanced, um, or especially for very uh, rare. And yet, they are relevant in the sense that it um, gives you a feeling of the kind of more researchy per se, but it's very practical. This is how um, data gets realized. One of the fun way to kind of think about what kind of web systems are where users are going is to think about the kind of data they do. And documents, I guess they were documents, databases on the web, social data on the web, this, this one this way, or one particular search. This one, this is the very different kind of social data, the ones in the forums compared to the tweets that I discussed. Um, and the uh, last presentation, that will be followed by uh, sensor data. Sensor that is data that is created by your, uh, your uh, some sensors in your iPhones or Android phones. Uh, sensors that can be connected by Bluetooth with your mobile. Um, or sensors that are on the road that Measure the traffic speed or the video and uh, how do you address that problem? Uh, and uh, one of the most exciting things that is happening today related uh, to the web is that uh, the web is more something that people use browser to view is changing drastically in the developing countries uh, and in many countries in Asia and where the growth is. More people, large, many more people access. Uh, the web or internet or content uh, via their mobile phone and that the consumption is very different than what you and I have been used to using the search engines that we do now. So how do farmers get to the information they want using their mobile phone? And there are many exciting things happening like voice activated search and many other things of that nature. 
not only the kinds that you see, for example, the voice search that Google has, yeah. but even those that are very specific, the like farmers mm -hmm. and, and how can you do that from features point of view? And beyond that, what is happening is that um, there are all kinds of devices uh, that are becoming internet for the speech. So there is there are words called Internet of Things or Web of Things. So there are billions of devices, like devices that are sensors in your uh, car that are talking to other cars in their sensors. That's started to happen all the now, whether you know or not. Or that uh, there are uh, uh, sensors in your fidget. And they are coming, and of course, you see the sensors, but they are all coming on a line. And then how do you build applications? That's all that's exciting. All right. Any questions, any comments, any ideas? Yes. I did have a question about the approach. Uh, the, uh, what are you doing? Or is that a standalone thing? Or is that a database going in? Because as far as you know, doing something like that, you can browse, but you can't. There's a, there's a software, it's a library. really just a matter of collecting data and showing it. 